So with this excellent keynote just given by Mr. Guy Ryder to set the scene, we will now start our first panel for this conference. And the title of the panel is Why Space Sustainability Matters and Its Impact on Our Global Future. For those of you who arrived a little late or have just joined us online, my name is Peter Martinez and I am the Executive Director of Secure World Foundation and I will be the moderator of this panel. There is, as many of you know, a growing focus on the importance of sustainability for resolving global challenges and this has given rise to many different initiatives from governments, the private sector and civil society and space is critical to addressing these challenges. Now to illustrate this, the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs has created a web page with examples of how space can serve each of the sustainable development goals. You can Google it, it's the page, uh, you can find it by Googling space for SDGs. But as we all know, space activities themselves are now increasingly facing sustainability challenges as well. Space is becoming increasingly congested with active satellites, increasingly contaminated with space debris, and increasingly contested by state and non-state actors alike. The session will therefore highlight the value of space capabilities for global sustainability and the challenges of space sustainability. The session will also address the space component of the upcoming UN Summit of the Future that Mr. Ryder spoke about in his opening keynote, and we will do so from a sustainability perspective. So our themes during this session will be the following. Firstly, why it's important to connect the discussions in the space community to broader issues and challenges outside of the space domain. Secondly, how space can help to address these major global challenges. Thirdly, what are the major initiatives underway to address space sustainability challenges? And lastly, how can industry and governments work together on space sustainability and helping to use space to address these global challenges? To discuss these themes, we have an excellent panel of experts with us here this morning, starting from my left here, we have Mr. Hugo André Costa, who is an executive board member of the Portuguese Space Agency. Welcome, André, or oh, Hugo, sorry. Um, next, we have Mark Dickinson, who's the deputy CTO and vice president of the uh, space segment at Viasat. Welcome. Then uh, we have Walt Everett's of uh, Vice President of Space and Ground Services at Iridium. Welcome. Then uh, Rebecca Everden, from, uh, who's the Director of Space of the recently established uh, Department for Space, Science, Innovation and Technology, DSIT in the UK. And then finally, uh, Valda Vikmanis Keller, Director of the Office of Space Affairs at the US Department of State. So welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to participate in our discussion this morning. So with that, we will now go right into our panel discussion. This will be a moderated discussion. I will start with an initial round of questions to the panelists. And members of the audience, uh, either present in person or online, will be able to uh, pose questions as well through the Hoover app. You saw the, the links posted earlier on uh, at the start of the session. We will try to address as many of the questions as possible during the time available to us, and in the interest of time, we may combine related questions. So, um, starting with uh, Rebecca, my first question will be to you. Uh, let's uh, start by digging into the why we should care about space sustainability. How does space sustainability on Earth link to sustainability in space? Thank you, Peter. Uh, and good morning to all of you. It is really, really uh, delightful to be here in New York for this summit. Um, I can hardly believe, actually, it's only a year since we were at the Science Museum <laughs> um, last summer. Uh, and um, 
uh, I think there's been really good progress actually uh, since that summit last year uh, and my um, thanks and congratulations to everybody who's been involved in, in those milestones, some of which of course Guy Ryder referenced in his opening keynote. Uh, space sustainability um, is an ever more important issue for us in the UK. It's become one of the priorities of our minister, our science minister, George Freeman, who spoke at that summit last year. Uh, and it's becoming clearly one of the defining issues for all of us who uh, work in or with the space sector. And I think that's why we're seeing you know, ever-growing numbers. It's wonderful to hear how many people are listening to this summit uh, online this morning, as well as, of course, all of you here in the room. And it's, of course, why our, our space agency in the UK are working so closely with the Secure World Foundation um, to, to raise the profile of this critical issue. So just to come directly to your question, Peter, uh, why does this matter? Uh, well, I mean, it matters because, of course, what we do in space is absolutely intertwined and codependent with what we do on Earth. Uh, we, we could not function, and of course, you know, most of you know this, but I'm not sure that all of our citizens from the countries that we represent really understand this yet. Um, we couldn't really function in the way that we do today as societies without uh, having the assets that we do in space. And of course, you know, if we don't act in the right way to protect those assets, to set out the rules of the road then our way of life on Earth ultimately um, will become less sustainable. So I think that's the key message that we have to give to our citizens. This is not because um, you know, we are not spending so much time talking about sustainability um, because you know, we're only interested in deep space, as inspirational as exploration is. And again, we heard Guy Ryder talking about this, and I absolutely agree, going back to deep space, is, a, is an inspirational and important topic. But actually, the things that the, the citizens of our countries rely on every day, you know, whether it's uh, to manage food supplies, whether it's to manage how our energy grid works, whether it's you know, simply doing the things that we love, streaming programs, talking to our friends in other countries, we rely on space for that. And therefore, if we don't find a sustainable way of managing space, we are not going to be able to do those things on Earth. So I think that, that is the key message that we have to find a way to communicate within our governments and with our citizens in order to make, uh, the, make the decision makers um, take the right decisions ultimately. And this is, of course, a global challenge, um, stating the obvious as we're all sitting here, um, many of us having uh, flown in to discuss this and people listening all around the world. And it will, it will ultimately require a global solution. But I think that, that should not hold us back from doing what we can in our, in our individual countries, with our individual companies. And I hope we'll come on to talk about some really fantastic examples of what we're doing there as we move towards ultimately what we will need is some sort of global solution for this, for this very big global challenge. But yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's going to be a, a defining issue, um, and it's very good to hear that the United Nations is taking this uh, seriously and putting it at the heart of its agenda for its, its future summit. Thank you, Rebecca. So you mentioned the, the potentially bad things that could happen uh, if we don't address these sustainability issues. So I want to address my next question to Walt. So Walt, as a representative of a long-standing satellite operator and one that's already experienced a debris-causing event from a, um, a derelict satellite crashing into one of yours, I'd like to uh, ask your thoughts on where you see this issue of space sustainability as it stands today and what progress has been made over the last few years, and what are some of the open challenges? Uh, thank you, Peter, and uh, again, thank you for, for the invite. Um, I guess, as Rebecca said, uh, the challenges really are economic. I mean, I think that's a very, very large part of what we have to deal with. Um, as an owner-operator, we have to start thinking in terms of how does space sustainability relate to the economics of the world, really. Um, yes, we, we um, back in 2009, uh, was a tragedy, um, something I wish never had happened, uh, but it also was a wake-up call for industry. And a wake-up call for industry, wake-up call for governments, wake-up call for, you know, even Secure World Foundation at the time, uh, to try to look at 
um, this particular issue and how we can improve this issue for owner operators, for governments, for regulatory bodies. Um, it's unfortunate that it happened, but there's a silver lining in all of that. And that's that there's an awareness right now, uh, and it continues to improve, of why this really does matter. It's, it's your opening comments. Why do we care? Well, we care because economics makes it important for us to uh, have space as, as a viable asset. Uh, and I think it's up to all of us, owner operators, governments, um, private entity, entities, you know, civil entities, uh, to make sure we're thinking in terms of how do we sustain space? How do we sustain this opportunity that presents itself? So, um, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to, to think in terms of where we were 10 years ago, where we are today, and kind of where we need to be in the future. Um, where we need to be in the future is, is dependent upon responsible behaviors for all of those entities that I've already mentioned. You know, it's part of uh, how you would like to design your satellites, how you would like to maintain your operations, how you would like to um, ensure that the, the, the opportunities continue to exist. The challenges there, um, unfortunately, are some nation states that are non-compliant, are doing ASAT tests, as you mentioned in your opening, um, that, that make it much more difficult for all of us to continue to uh, operate in this space, no pun intended. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to think in terms of what we should be doing and what we continue to push forward, you know, the norms of behavior, as you, as you mentioned, and the guidelines that we all continue to pursue. I think the more we talk about it, the more we, we press those uh, nation states and other owner operators to, you know, be responsible, to collaborate, to, you know, be open about it. I think that's where we really want to go. And that's what I think we should be doing. Thank you. And st staying with this theme of, of the role of industry in, in all of this, uh, Mark, last year, um, Inmarsat, which has recently merged with Viasat, um, released a report looking at how industry and government bodies might start down this path of space sustainability with practical and actionable initiatives that could be immediately adopted by all satellite operators. What did you learn in that exercise and, and what do you think has changed for 2023? Okay, uh, thank you, Peter, and likewise, it's great to be here. Um, that report, um, not that we thought we had all the perfect answers. We had a lot of good feedback from it. I think it really, we saw that space sustainability was at a sort of a tipping point. We really felt the urgency and we wanted to flag the urgency um, and get feedback from people, put some ideas out there, get a, a discussion started. Uh, about how we should move forward because it became clear to us that time is fast running out and we can, we don't, we can only talk for so long, we need to get on and do some things to try and fix it. So I went back a couple, a couple, last Saturday, I downloaded the latest catalogue to see how many active spacecraft there are in orbit today, to see how many satellites have been launched since we met in London, which seems like only about a month ago. Yeah, on Saturday, it's 2,610 spacecraft or well, 32% of all active spacecraft have been launched since we met in London. So that really gives you a feel for the pace of change. But then, yesterday, I realised that there's a Transporter 8 launch yesterday and a Starlink launch, which put another 138 satellites in orbit on Sunday. So that number's actually 2,700 and something. So it feels like we are launching stuff into space without real due consideration of the impact. We're doing things with mitigation measures afterwards and really good, really good efforts around SSA, uh, active dev rem removal. All this stuff is interesting, but it's really addressing the issue after we've caused it by once things are launched, then it's in space and then needs to be managed. So for, uh, the way that we see it is that we need better understanding of the impact of something being launched in orbit. Getting uh, idea, so I, I fall in the trap as well, talking about number of spacecraft. Number of spacecraft is only one in metric in terms of the impact. You have the size of spacecraft, the mass, the cross-sectional area, how reliable it is, which orbit it's in. All these parameters, we need to come to some scientific consensus to understand exactly what the impact is before we launch, 
rather than try and address it after we've launched. And this all comes into this sort of orbital carrying capacity. Some way of being able to make an informed assessment about the impact, both in making sure that we don't cause a sustainability issue in the future, but also from an equitable point of view. It's all, all well and good people launching into, into thousands of spacecraft into certain orbits, but what about the people who are going to come in the future? Different nations, and we heard from the, the excellent uh, keynote from the UN. One of the key tenets of the UN is open and free access and equitable use of resources, especially in space. What are we doing? How do we use things like orbital carrying capacity to make that sort of that judgment? So, uh, yeah, I'm, a lot has happened in 12 months since uh, London, and I, the efforts, especially in the UK that I see, ESA, the Department of Commerce, efforts from WEF and uh, Space Safety Coalition as well. I know Dan is in the room as well. These are all, all to be welcomed. But I feel the time is that we really have to get a more scientific grip of what the impact is before we make decisions, which we then come to regret. Because um, as Rebecca said, I'm, access to space is absolutely fundamental uh, to humanity, not for us, but also for our future generations. And unfortunately, problems we create now in space could be very long lasting indeed. And we, we owe it to future generations to act responsibly now Make, make scientific-based assessments before we actually embark in, in new missions. And so, um, yeah. so we learned a lot from the report, but a lot more to do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing to think how much has happened uh, in space since we, we had the summit in London just a year ago, right? And so thanks for those, those launch numbers, quite sobering. So turning then our gaze from industry to government with its role of, of, of regulation and, 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 um, uh, and putting in place mechanisms for governance, I, I'd like to address my next question to Hugo uh, in, in your capacity as a, a, a government representative to Corpus and also with the, the Portuguese Space Agency. Um, as Guy uh, Ryder noted in his uh, opening keynote, the UN is currently preparing for the summit of the future to uh, address global challenges, and space governance has been identified as one of those themes for discussion. In your view, why is the summit important, and how does, uh, and perhaps I should ask in the, in the view of, of Portugal, as, as sort of a, uh, as, uh, one of the newer space-faring uh, nations, why is the summit of the future important, and how does space sustainability fit into that discussion? Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for, for inviting me. It's, 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 uh, the conference, the symposium is, is wonderful, the, the speakers that you, you have. I think it's going to be a great two days uh, and a lot that we can also uh, learn from for the, the meeting that we're going to host next, uh, next year. Uh, we heard from uh, Under Secretary General uh, Ryder that space, the, the summit of the future, in fact, is, is a request, is a result of a request from member states, right? Uh, we need uh, uh, new, we have, we are facing new global challenges and we need multilateral agreements. Uh, we need to strengthen our global governance. Uh, this is across to all economic sectors and space is one of them. Uh, we know that space is very much discussed in, in Vienna uh, and Copus and it should always be uh, like that, right? But what the summit of the future brings is that an opportunity to bring space to New York to be discussed at the highest level. And I think uh, this is perhaps the first time that space is uh, put it in the, one of the po first points of the agenda um, in New York. So with the, the, the summit of the future for next, uh, next year, uh, we, before that, we need to start to having these discussions in order to have um, a fruitful discussion later on in September next year. So for that, what we propose to, to UNOSA, uh, we, the Portuguese uh, Space Agency and the Portuguese government, is to, to host a conference next year on space, on the management of uh, space uh, activities. Uh, this is going to be, as, as Mr. Ryder said, in spring next year. But before that, uh, we want to host two virtual conferences. And why virtual? And uh, nowadays, everyone can meet physically, right? But the problem is that we want to be in as inclusive as possible. This means that we're going to bring um, everyone around the globe from the different member states to discuss uh, the three major topics that were, uh, are presented in the policy brief. And the policy brief identified uh, space traffic coordination, space debris, and resource management as the three main um, actions that we need to discuss upon. And so we're going to host these virtual meetings, first one in October this year, 
to discuss from the technical point of view, and then uh, in March next year to discuss policy uh, issues on these three main topics. And I was listening very carefully when, when Mark said about we need to look into the scientific uh, aspects of, of all of these discussions. And in COPUS, uh, this is uh, a forum for member states. So normally, uh, academia and uh, industry is not involved in the discussions. But because this conference that we are organizing as, uh, is not under the COPUS um, uh, way of work, let's say, we will bring industry, we want to bring also uh, academia to have these informal discussions in preparation of, of the conference of next year. So we will involve uh, the member states, industry, academia during these virtual conferences, again in October and March next year, uh, to have uh, you know, a very broad discussion, to touch on the, on the points that uh, are difficult to discuss within COPUS, and, uh, and among member states, because this will be the only way that uh, we can prepare for the future. And we know that, um, that most of the agreements, uh, the, the agreements that we have in space have been developed during the 60s, the 70s, and, um, and basically what the people back then were doing were preparing for were the days that we are today. And what we'll be doing um, in the summit of the future and discussing about the space issues, mainly on space traffic coordination, space resources, will be preparing for the next generations. Um, it's probably not going to be so much for our generation, but uh, we're preparing the future for, for them. And also because of that, we will include uh, not just these three components on the, the discussions, but we also want to bring youth and to have uh, the youth uh, discussing on these topics, also to have their point of view, and then to be presented uh, here in the summit of the future. But hopefully we'll get uh, in May next year during our conference um, a good representation from member states. We are trying to bring them as uh, all of them. Uh, we want to be inclusive from the member states, from the, from the industry and also academia, because all together we need to solve the issues that we are facing, and only together we can do it. We have seen that uh, in challenging times, uh, we are able to, to come together, so we are facing new challenging times and we'll be able to come together. Thank you. And uh, staying with this uh, theme of the role of government, uh, I'd like to address my next question to Valda. Valda, the uh, US State Department has uh, recently released the um, first ever strategic framework for space diplomacy. Can you give us a brief recap of this framework and how sustainability fits into it? Thank you, Peter, and thank you to the Secure World Foundation for hosting this event, uh, for allowing my participation in this panel along with my distinguished colleagues. Um, I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk about um, the strategic framework, which was approved by Secretary Blinken two weeks ago. Um, and I think we've heard everybody who's spoken so far today um, sort of acknowledge that long-term uh, space sustainability, um, preserving space for future generations, relies on the cooperation between um, nations globally, private industry, academia, many different actors. And the State Department, we believe, um, given our role um, as the diplomatic lead, we are, we are uniquely positioned to take these various diplomatic efforts that take place across the Department of State, various offices, not just my office, um, and how we can bring those together and elevate the role of diplomacy in this discussion of space sustainability. So that's what we've done with the creation of this strategic framework. And we've broken it into essentially three different categories or buckets, if you will. One is looking at how do we use our diplomatic efforts to advance space, uh, secure, sustainable uh, space. The second bucket is how do we use space to advance our diplomatic goals? So diplomacy for space, space for diplomacy. How do we take the excellent data, the information, the richness of the data and the, that we get from space, and how can we use that to address some of the global challenges that we have, whether it's climate change or uh, severe weather or forest fires, and how can we bring that, fold that into our diplomatic discussions that we have? 
And then the third bucket is, you know, you've heard everybody here talk about how rapidly things are changing in the space sector and, uh, you know, exponentially. And the fact is we have a diplomatic core. We need to ensure that the people who work at the State Department, whether in Washington, D.C., or who are posted overseas, understand and have the tools that they need to engage in this space diplomacy, whether it's with commercial sector actors or with foreign uh, counterparts and interlocutors. So the third leg of this, um, this strategy is ensuring that we do the work that we need to within our own department to raise that level of knowledge and expertise. And then how does this fit into sort of uh, sustainability writ large? I know that Hugo and I just got back from uh, Vienna where I was head of the US delegation uh, for Copious. Um, and one of the things that we talk about there, and it's very much the role of, of diplomacy, is how do we implement, for example, these long-term sustainability guidelines that were agreed to um, after, I think, a decade in 2019. Now, now we're actually at the point of how do we implement them? How do we work with our partners um, within the UN to identify what each country is doing, what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, where can we work together. So that's very much a narrative, and I think Hugo would agree that was a very big part of the discussion that took place over the past two weeks um, in Vienna. And then, of course, the other piece is continuing to engage um, on our side, whether, whether it's multilaterally in venues in the form like Copious, or bilaterally through civil space dialogues or comprehensive dialogues. Um, we engage with the commercial space sector as well, because obviously the, that's where really the growth is, and um, we need to make sure that they have a seat at the table. I will note that at um, Copious, the US um, invites, uh, puts out a request for proposal, and we do actually have representatives from academia and from the private sector who participate um, in recognition of the fact that these are the voices we need at the table, we need to be telling us what are the things that we might not be thinking about that we need to be thinking about and that we need to be addressing. So in all of these are just two small examples, but um, two key areas in which diplomacy plays a key role, and I am hopeful. If you haven't read the, the uh, framework, it is available on the State Department website. I'd ask you to do so. Also, very happy to get feedback, thoughts, comments from anybody who would like to offer those up. Um, but I think that this is very much a step in the right direction for us. Um, and in fact, I had um, some conversations with some international partners who said that they were particularly interested in the release of this framework, um, the strategic framework, because they felt that this in their own foreign um, uh, ministries of foreign affairs, that this would potentially, it would be an example that they could point to potentially as um, elevating diplomacy within their own countries. Um, space dialogues, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Balder. And I see the questions are coming in. That's great. We're getting some great questions here. Please uh, do keep sending in those questions. So, uh, Rebecca, following up on um, Valda's um, remarks on um, the, uh, the role of governments for um, improving um, governments, uh, space governance internationally, what's your take on the current status and challenges of space governance and what are some of the priority areas that the UK is focusing on? Thank you. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it's really great to see the, um, the framework. I think that's an enormous help in how we think about um, what it is that we need to do next. Um, so well, let me just say a little bit about how we're thinking about this in, in the UK, because I think what is going to be... Um, very, very, you know, what's going to be critical to getting buy into this as we go forward is making sure that as government we're working closely with industry to find the right kind of regulatory framework that will both deliver on what we want from space sustainability, so continued access to space, assets which are uh, secure and protected, and allowing expansion of our activities in space as well. We, we in you know, the UK, we want to grow our space economy. We don't want to constrain growth. We want the UK to be a place where uh, businesses want to come and uh, conduct their space activities. So that's, you know, that's got to be balanced out with the need to find some sort of regulatory framework which uh, 
you know, preserves access to space, which allows activities to be conducted sustainability, sustainably. And I think that is the challenge that we are facing as we think about it. And there's a couple of different things that we're doing in the UK as we try and explore uh, what, would, what we think would work domestically, of course, in line with all of those um, other things that are going on on the international level. And so we are, we are working uh, with our industry in the UK to look at a voluntary standard um, as a, a sort of initial way of testing what it is we might be aiming at. And there's some really good work going on, um, which hopefully we'll hear more about later this year, to see the kind of standards that we could expect industry to adhere to with potentially future benefits uh, when it comes to licensing and insurance models as well. So, you know, a bit of regulation and a bit of uh, benefit um, to, to balance out the approach. Um, we have got a number of mechanisms in the UK which we've established to make sure that we're having a really open dialogue with industry. Uh, we've got a Space Safety Regulatory Council, which is run by our transport department, which is a really important forum for hearing how industry are, are feeling about what we're doing in government. Um, and then um, the other thing that we're doing um, is we are um, about to issue a consultation around how we think about uh, liabilities in space. Uh, again, you know, bringing together the interest from the insurance community, the investment community, the business community, with government, including our regulators, to try and come to some sort of sweet spot which will allow us to manage what we want to do in space sustainably, but make sure that we're continuing to grow our space economy. Because if we don't do that, then you know, ultimately the, the political interest in what we're trying to do here will wane. We need to have a strong business voice uh, working with government in order to make sure we come to the right political solution. That's my message there. Thank you. And that's a sort of a perfect lead into the next question I want to ask, because you, know, you know, talk about building the space economy. And so I'd like to, to turn to um, our uh, industry representatives on the panel. So, Mark, um, one of the themes for the, the summit over the next two days is how to reinforce space sustainability through corporate actions, right? And so can you talk to us about why space sustainability is key to commercial growth and how space companies are looking to incorporate space sustainability and ESG into their businesses? Yes, yeah, so I can, I can talk from the legacy Inmarsat business and the approach that we took to space sustainability. And it is a topic which has a, a, got a lot of corporate attention. And we invested a significant effort in understanding what our impact was going to be. And in fact, we, I think we were the first company to actually offset our launch uh, carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. We went through, a process of, went through a scientific process of determining how much that was. Because it was important then we, when we had an ESG uh, initiative that it wasn't greenwashing. It was really, you know, this was actually meaningful and actually trying to address something in the science, again, come back to the scientific approach. So, yeah, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing, uh, I know a panel session, I think it's this afternoon on ESG and the effort, I'm really looking forward to that because I think for all organisations it's a very important topic and will only become more important. And I would ask that when people look at this, they do it in, a, uh, in, in that scientific way to make sure they're implementing things which are really meaningful and are going to cause long-term benefit. I, in a, a, we're in a well, space bubble. We've been talking in investment bubble for many years in space, whether there's a real bubble, whether it's going to come to an end. I think there was an interesting conference in London last week hosted by the Financial Times where uh, maybe some of the, uh, a bit of a reality check for some parts. We've got to be careful that we don't um, start promoting a, an environment where you have sort of a Silicon Valley type of, let's invest in 10 companies and hope one pays off as going to be a unicorn and the other nine just die away. Because if the other nine have launched stuff into space, they can't just die away. That would be very bad. And, and there's been... You know from personal experience in terms Absolutely. of almost got to a point when uh, Iridium was, was decommissioned and brought back in, but it luckily managed to find a way, a way forward and then a very prosperous company come out of it. But that model, well, that might not happen again in the future. We need to be careful about when investment is made, it's made in a responsible way with a strong ESG uh, footprint um, agenda. Thank you. Um, and then... Just following through on this, uh, Walt uh, Iridium uh, has for many years um, 
been an active voice in developing voluntary industry best practices and guidelines for space sustainability through engaging the various initiatives like the, the uh, Space Safety Coalition or uh, the development of the recently of the, um, the, the document containing the orbital safety best practices uh, that uh, uh, Iridium worked on with uh, OneWeb and SpaceX. So what relationship, if any, do these industry-driven efforts have to space sustainability discussions in the multilateral fora? How do we avoid a sort of uh, a fragmentation and, uh, and duplication of efforts? And what role do you think those multilateral fora have in ensuring that industry follows through on these voluntary commitments? Um, so thank you, Mark, for uh, noting you know, the, the, the challenges that Iridium had and uh, how successful we've been. And, and, and really, we're very proud of that. Um, you know. We are very we are very proud of what we've done in in promoting space sustainability. And you and you cited a few uh, documents that we we've endorsed and, and written. Um, what what I'm excited about, and I think you mentioned it earlier, is how that how that uh, opens up opportunities for young professionals and also for new businesses. I, I was you know looking beyond you and the event sponsors. If you look at some of the names there. You know, the catapults, the Leo labs, the slingshots, right? They weren't there 10 years ago. And we have to start thinking in terms of how do, how do the um, rules of the road, the guidelines, the promotability of sustainability, all of that, um, it, it somewhat enables all of those new businesses and the opportunities for, for young professionals going forward. Um, so where do I where do I see it? Um, I kind of always look forward again. Uh, I'm always trying to think in terms of how do we continue to promote these these rules of the road, these guidelines, these these best practices, and how does that then enable new businesses and new capabilities and opportunities out there uh, for some of the things that you know we mentioned earlier about economics and about how that that will all enable. Um, not just businesses to grow, but new new businesses to grow, and then you reach into cislunar, as you're going to talk about later. Um, you know, I, I really do believe that it's it's in our best interest as owner operators, as as government regulators, as as the UN, to continue to push this forward so that new businesses start to thrive, start to to prosper, and it's not the nine that fail, it's the, it's the 10 that are successful that I think will actually uh, will help space sustainability going forward forever. You know, if we keep that momentum up, that's what I think we really need to continue to do. Just keep that momentum up, keep those, those things in the forefront of all of the agencies that I mentioned earlier, and then I think it's going to become a much easier process. So. That's what I think we need to do, and I think we continue to do that. Thank you. So now I'd like to take the discussion in a uh, slightly uh, new direction, and um, this to talk about um, uh, cislunar um, uh, activities. So I'd like to address my next question to Valda. Uh, Valda, the, the, um, one of the themes uh, for our summit um, is... Um, uh, cislunar space, the expansion of activities into cislunar space, and the renewed interest in lunar space activities. I know this is something that uh, the U.S. is uh, looking at with uh, the Artemis Accords. Can you talk about how you're approaching this issue and how we can build international governments' fr frameworks for space activities beyond LEO? Uh, thanks very much, Peter. And I think um, the Artemis Accords are really a success story that is shared by, by all the now 25 signatories. And I would note that we signed with an original eight in 2000. We're up to 25. Um, Spain just signed last week, a week and a half ago, at the Africa Leaders Summit um, in uh, Washington, uh, we had two African nations signed, so the number of signatories is growing, and I suspect that most in the audience know what the Artemis Accords are, but in case somebody doesn't, I mean, it's a set of uh, non-legally binding uh, principles that countries voluntarily agree to um, that 
talk about how they will conduct themselves in space as responsible space actors. Um, and I think this is a, the Artemis Accords offer an excellent starting point for some of these important discussions that we are having about sustainability. Um, initially, the, you know, the goal was to get more signatories. That remains a goal. We would very much welcome any country that um, wants to adhere or plans to adhere to these principles to join the Artemis Accords. But the Acar Artemis Accords need to be something more than simply a list of signatories that have signed on to these. We need to do something practical with it. And so last September, at the International Astronautical Congress in Paris, we had the first ever meeting of the then 21 signatories. It was heads of space agencies, so very senior representation. And we talked about what the accords mean. What do we do with the accords now that there is this momentum and uh, more and more countries willing to, to uh, join? And we have created when I say we, I mean the Artemis signatories. I'm not saying the United States because this is a shared endeavor, have created two working groups as part of the Artemis Accords, um, the larger Artemis Accords signatories um, group. And one is focused on deconflicting activities on the lunar surface. And the second is focused on, I believe we haven't, uh, the group hasn't agreed on a name, but essentially what is the val uh, a group focused on what is the value of joining the Artemis Accords if you are perhaps a nation that is a nascent spacefaring nation or a, a nation that may not ultimately be in the space industry, why would it be in your interest to join the Accords? Um, and so these two groups have been meeting monthly, virtually, and will have um, sort of uh, pr provide a readout and uh, a way forward when we meet again in Baku on the margins of the next IAC. And I think it's important to note that, you know, this, fr from a U.S. perspective, we are very heartened to know that, um, for example, one of the working groups, it's not led by the U.S. We have two other Artemis signatories who have uh, stepped up to lead and move this, um, move this forward. And so that is, you know, and there's room at the table. These sustainability issues have been raised, and there's something that we are grappling with and the accords are that group of actors the more we work together the more people we bring into the artemis fold it's a wonderful platform to discuss these sustainability issues and get the various views from partners who are differently situated some who are advanced space faring nations some who are um, newer to space and those are all valuable voices and this gives us an opportunity to include those voices hear what they have to say and then, of course, bring this information and these conversations into the multilateral fora that we have, for example, at Copuis. So it's very much um, something that is complementary to existing multilateral efforts, and I think enriches them. Thank you, Valder. And sort of following on from the, the um, uh, point you just made uh, towards the end are you, with your reference to Copuis, as um, many people in the room know, the Copuis uh, went through a uh, a lengthy uh, eight-year process to generate the guidelines for space sustainability. Um, and uh, a number of the member states are now focused on the implementation of those guidelines. I know this is a, a matter of, of interest to, to Portugal, so I'd like to address my next question to Hugo, is, uh, and that is, how can national governments work with UNUSA and COPUS on, on space sustainability in general and the implementation of the LTS guidelines in particular? Thank you, Peter. Well, we have heard this morning already that uh, COPUS was created just two years after the launch of, of uh, the first satellite. And during that period, um, the work that has been done in the, in the committee, uh, it was done through very challenging times. They are different today, but also we are facing uh, challenging moments where uh, some nations see space in, in, different, uh, in different ways. Uh, but one very interesting thing of COPUS is that, for example, just last week, as, as Val mentioned, we finished uh, the 60, 66th session, and uh, although the two last days were very long days until 11 p.m., it was able that 102 members of COPUS came to an agreement and the, the report was adopted and accepted by everyone. Uh, they, they call it, this is the spirit of Vienna. I think you're very well known, uh, this, uh, the spirit of Yen, where in the end, there's always a way to find consensus among uh, everyone. 
And we also discussed today that we need to prepare for the future, and preparing in two ways. One is uh, resource management. Uh, thanks to US, we are, again, back to explore uh, space in, in a different way that has been explored in the last decades. Uh, so we need to, to look at it and uh, how, how we will do it. And the second way, it's, again, space sustainability in what is comes to Earth's orbit. Everyone here, perhaps, has used space information uh, or space data coming to, to this meeting. is just could be meteorological data to see if you have to bring your umbrella or not, uh, or the, where do you have to walk in New, in New York uh, to, find the, to find the venue. So we need to ensure that the sustainability of space activities, and this is why it is important to reinforce COPUS, where the, the discussions about space are, are being held uh, uh, within the, the member states, and also UNOSA. The next 10 years is going to be very important to discuss uh, th these issues uh, that I just mentioned. Um, of course, sustainability comes to space traffic coordination, also sp space debris. But this will be very important in the next 10 years because wherever you do now, it's going to ha have impact on the, da on the daily lives we have here and also how we will explore um, uh, the, space, uh, the space. The other aspect is if, if you fast forward a little bit, and uh, we are returning to the moon. And when you go to the moon, you again, you will need telecommunications, you need uh, positioning uh, systems. So meaning that you will have to have satellites orbiting the moon to provide this service to you. So the moon is a little bit different from Earth because there's no atmosphere, so you cannot burn satellites uh, in the atmosphere going down to the moon. Um, and so a totally different concept has to be think about uh, between us all on how to address the congestion uh, of orbits around the moon. Um, there is why it is important for one, day, for one aspect that the fact that we just finished the discussions on LTS and we already initiated the discussions on LTS uh, 2.0 because um, we need to look forward and we need to, to see how it's going to be in the future. But the point right now is also important is the implementation of the LTS. And I think the member states have an important point in two ways. One, again, reinforcing COPUS and UNOSA's role uh, at UN level and also on, the, on, on looking the future of coordination of, of space activities. But also member states has an important point, which is implementing the LTS that has been agreed uh, between all member states. In our case in Portugal, we are just translating this LTS into our national space law, where companies will have to show how they will uh, comply with, uh, with these guidelines. Um, so, to, to wrap up, and uh, again, we need a very uh, strong international collaborations. So we need to continue work that has been done in COPUS, take the opportunity of the Summit of the Future and the conference that is going to be organized to have the discussions that are more difficult to have uh, in, a, in, in a formal uh, meetings, but to have these discussions in this uh, conference next year to bring it to summit of the future because it's also through the difficult conversations and the difficult discussions that we're going to have that then we can um, uh, support the work in COPUS and moving forward in the, in the next phase of exploration. Thank you. So this um, is a good point to transition over to the audience questions and um, one of the first questions that I'd like to ask it's been posed by, by the audience um, uh, relates to uh, things such as the LTS guidelines, which are voluntary, non-binding commitments. And so the question is, are voluntary practices going to be enough to prevent the next collision in space? Uh, who would like to have a go at that? Excellent question. I mean, the first, first thing I'd say is it, it's, um, it's a concern that we've all had, is whether these voluntary guidelines uh, are enough or do we have to move towards regulation. Um, I, I th personally speaking, I believe that the voluntary guidelines are moving us in the right direction. Whether it gets us to that end game, I don't know. Um, I think at some point in time there's probably some uh, soft regulations that need to come into play. Um, at, at, at the same time, you don't want those regulations to inhibit the economic growth and, and that's where I think the challenge really becomes is if you, if you restrict certain things and, and make it so that it's, it's really difficult for some of the new entrants to um, benefit from the, from the 
uh, opportunities in space, I think that's where your challenge is. So the quick answer is, I think guidelines are moving us in the right direction. I think at some point in time we'll probably go to some sort of soft regulation. Yeah. yeah. Well, also, um, to building on that, just to make the point that uh, the guidelines are non-binding, right? But non-binding right. doesn't mean non-legal in the sense that yeah. states can choose to implement these non-binding kind of political commitments that they've made in four right. like corpus into their national legislation for the authorization and ongoing supervision of space activities. We've seen that, for example, yeah. with the space debris guidelines, right? Num right? Quite a number of nations have done that. So there is a, I agree with you, there is kind of a route there to, um, to implementing the, them in sort of in legal frameworks. Just one comment to follow on. I, I do get concerned that I'm, the voluntary and the best practice are good initiatives. I do get concerned that they're seen as the answer. They're not. They're, they're a useful tool, maybe, but actually something more substantial needs to be behind it in the end. And I think, as with any global commons, I think some form of regulation is needed because I, don't think, I can't think of a global commons that has been unregulated and has been successful or hasn't been environmentally impacted in a large way. So you look at global fishing, for example, that is a regulated global commons. And I think it's something similar will be needed eventually. Hopefully not in the too distant future, because I say, if we're launching 2,500 spacecraft every year, um, we don't have a huge amount of time to make sure we're getting this right. Yeah. Rebecca? Yeah, just to add one further thought, which is, I mean, I tend to agree, you know, I think ultimately voluntary approaches will probably not get us all of the way there. But what they are useful for is testing approaches and what works and what doesn't work, whereas, you know, kind of creating heavy-handed regulation from the off can be, you know, quite dangerous um, if you don't get it right. So you've, you've, you've got this as a useful approach for testing. And I think also for demonstrating that it can be done, you know, that you can find the pathway which will allow economic activity to flourish while achieving the ends of sustainability. And I think if we're able to demonstrate, you know, through different initiatives, um, you know, led by governments of nations that believe that this is an important issue, actually makes the global discussion much easier because you've got some very practical and workable examples with which to demonstrate that it can be achieved on a global scale. Thank you. So the next uh, topic that I'd like to move to, uh, another question posed by the audience, um, is, you know, we, uh, we, we talk about um, uh, multi-stakeholder engagement in these uh, discussions, especially in the multilateral fora, but um, that presents challenges. So um, my question to, to you, a number of you on the panel are involved in COPOS delegations. How, how do you see this multi-stakeholder engagement working in practice? Follow. So I will say this year was my first in-person COPOS. Um, it's slow. <laughs> it's frustrating. But ultimately, I think, I mean, it's one of these things. It's, it's a slow, steady process. And I think there... I, and truly, just having come back, having the, you know the highs and lows of, of the last two weeks in Copios, um, I don't think there's any substitute for the face-to-face -face diplomatic engagement, the building the relationships consistently, you know, at the at the uh, subcommittees, at the plenary. It's difficult, but we have to be sitting down and we have to be open to hearing all views, and there truly are, as you know. Uh, a real diversity of views, but that is the that is the only way forward. And you know, I think you have to have the right temperament um, and a lot of patience. But I think this is this is truly the way forward. And it's a it's long and slow. But if you know the the expression, um, I think I, I'm going to get it wrong. But NASA says you know, to the effect of we will go further if we go um, together. And that's a slow process, but ultimately a more fruitful one, I believe. Well, you, yeah, totally uh, agree with you. Uh, my, my first couples was last year, last year in, in, in presence, and uh, it's very difficult to have 102 different ways of seeing uh, the same thing and uh, bringing everyone together to the point that we all agree uh, in a sentence. It's very difficult uh, because the, the ways you, you read it, you, make, you need to make sure that who's going to read that is going to understand what you meant when you wrote that. And, and so it's, it's, it's very difficult, and uh, it is true that uh, 
having these physical meetings uh, now back in Vienna, it helps the discussions, it, it helps them uh, come to, to, to an agreement. And you just need to have um, nerves of steel to wait until the very last moments when all the agreements normally are reached uh, and to be able to, to, f to discuss the, uh, very, vividly, very vividly during the, those times uh, until we reach the, the, the agreement. But multilateral agreements are, will be the only way to, to move forward. Yeah, and, and I think that the challenge for COPOS is going to be uh, particularly how we um, engage the, the industry inputs, right? Because the industry is accumulating so much um, experience, on-orbit experience of safe and sustainable space activities. And that's one of the challenges facing COPOS. I think ITU has kind of put ahead in that regard. Yeah. Valde, you... And I, 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 to this. double down on that, Peter, um, you know, the, not all delegations bring representatives from the private sector. I would very much like to see greater private sector re representation at COPUS um, through technical presentations and other engagement um, increasingly is more important than ever. And we need to find a way, not just uh, U.S. industry, but um, industry from across the globe. They need to have a voice there, I think, if we're going to um, really address uh, these challenges in a in a holistic way. Thank you. If I may just on that and also on the previous question is that um, when you think about the summit of the future, one of the things uh, that could be uh, important to, to discuss will be exactly what Paula said, that was how to bring the private industry and academia into a more open discussion uh, also in, in COPUS and having their voices also heard in a different way uh, in COPUS because the first question was uh, about how to, uh, in the, um, second, the first one was the um, implementing uh, the LTS uh, right in a voluntary way. It's in the best interest of the space operators to do it as they look forward to not have these uh, uh, congestion uh, issues or having the, the spacecrafts um, colliding with each other. So, but it's also important to have their views in couples on how to work all together because industry moves in a really, really fast pace when compared to the discussions that we're having at, uh, at member states level. So we need to have both working together on that as well. Thank you. So our time is catching up with us. Uh, there's one, one question that uh, I'd like to, to pose to, to the panel and, and to get quick responses, and then we'll, we'll do sort of the, the wrap up. Um, so we've been talking a lot about multi-stakeholder engagement, but there's also the question of multi-generational engagement. And um, what role do, do, do you see for young professionals uh, to, to play in these processes and discussions? We'd like to have a go at this. I'll go first. So the, the experience that we've had is the younger generation are to, totally get the sustainability thing. They understand it and they're really motivated about it. So I look at the teams in, uh, in our organisation who are running the committees about space sustainability they're much, much younger average age than the rest of the company. They really get it, and they're really motivated to do. And for me, that's a great, that, that's a great sign that the future generations have really, they, they think about this as part of their, they don't think about it because they have to think about it. They think about it because they want to think about it and find solutions. And I, I, I take great comfort that there's, there's people coming through who are really who are smart people who've got clever ideas about how to address some of this. Thank you. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I just think the opportunity is endless, and, and they are really on that bleeding edge. They are, they are looking at things from a sustainability standpoint, from an ESG perspective, and then they also bring this, um, this kind of startup mentality of, you know, what can we do next to make this a, a, a more sustainable environment that we deal with? Absolutely. Alda, did you want to add? I was just going to say back to a point that you made um, earlier, Rebecca, about how do we talk about space so that it resonates not just as an aspirational, like, you know, going back to the moon and then beyond to Mars, but why, you know, why every day, why everybody should care about it. And I think making it more accessible from, the, from where I sit at the State Department, when we do outreach, you know, there are many different ways to come to space and work on these fascinating and incredibly important issues. You can come from an engineering background, an astrophysics background. You can be a philosophy major. I mean, there's a lot of different ways, and there's room for everybody to grapple and tackle these incredibly interesting challenges. And we need all of those different perspectives. So I think how do we communicate that 
it, it's, it's STEM and the, the incredibly uh, important, um, you know, more women and STEM, but also that there's no one way to get into doing this work. Rebecca, did you have a point you want to make as well? Yeah. Well, uh, I think, you know, this is an issue of the future and obviously young people are our future and we saw what Greta Thunberg did for the climate change debate. You know, maybe we need, a, we need a Greta for space. If, if there's somebody out there who wants to be Greta, please stand up. We've got, some, we've got some young people here with us at this summit. Maybe it's one of you. But I do think there is a way that we need to harness the youth voice and how we communicate this as an issue. And I think, you know, as, as governments, we don't... It, it can be perceived as quite a technical, sort of technocratic type issue. And of course, it's not. You know, it's an existential issue. Um, and we need to find a way to present it in that way. Um, so I think uh, stand up the next Greta and we'll, we'll get in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's, that's great. So uh, our time has caught up with us. I'd like to wrap up this panel now. Uh, but before doing so, I just want to give each of our panellists 10 seconds, your top takeaway message from today that you'd like the audience to... Starting with you, Are we Baldwin? starting with me? Okay, no pressure. <laughs> um, for me, the takeaway message is... Uh, the, com the need to work with um, our commercial sector colleagues um, more intensely, more thoroughly, internationally, that is going to be a key if we're going to get our hands around the sustainability issue. Great. Thank you. Rebecca? Uh, I think for me, this is about how we talk to our citizens about this being a priority um, and how we expand uh, the range of the conversations that we're having about this issue because it really does touch on so many walks of life. Thank you. Well, economics. It's, it's, you know, you have it here in New York, and this is the center of the economic universe, really. Um, it's, it's all about economics and how we can all prosper in this, and the only way to do that is, is via space sustainability. Thank you. Mark? Uh, time is running out. Time is the essence, and we, we need to act quickly. We need to do some things more than we've done in the past. It needs to be material and have a real impact in terms of where we are, in terms of what's in orbit in 10 years' time and how it's managed. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I agree with uh, my colleagues in the panel, but I'll just focus on, on the Summit of the Future and the Conference on uh, Managing the Sustainability of Space Activities next year in Portugal. Summit of the Future is going to be a very important moment to have the discussions. We want to bring youth, the academia, and the industry all together, so uh, we'll be happy to, to listen from you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that uh, brings us to the end of this panel. Please join me in thanking our speakers.